This is part two of our series titled 666, Decoding the Number of the Beast. And in part two, we're going to look at the book of Judges, chapter four, and some other chapters as well in the same book, and see how the mystery we've learned so far about the number 666 reveals something greater that we can expect to see in the end times. Let us begin in Judges chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, and it says, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazar, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in uh, Herosheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had nine hundred iron uh, chariots of iron and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of israel so as you can see here the people of israel once again turned back to their evil ways once king ehud passed away and so what the lord did is that the lord sent the canaanites to oppress the people of israel for 20 long years until they cried out to the lord for deliverance and so we see here that the principal focus so far is the canaanites and we shall begin by looking at King Jabin and see what kind of information that we can see as far as his rule in the land of Canaan. And so in looking at this significant portion of information, we are going to see a parallel take place between what happened back then around that time period and what we see happening now in the Middle East. And so it says Canaan was a Semitic speaking region in the ancient Near East roughly corresponding to the Levant example given modern-day Lebanon Israel Palestinian territories the western parts of Jordan and southwestern Syria now why do we care about this because the Canaanites they occupied this particular region today we see that Isis this new caliphate is slowly expanding to control the, the same exact areas and so what we know is that the canaanites they occupy to the corresponding levant areas what is the new name of isis what was it translated to later on was it not the islamic states of levant so right now we are already seeing a parallel between the Canaanites who once risen up and oppressed the people of Israel and now we see Isis and the spirit of the Canaanites once again reviving itself and controlling the same exact territories in which it did back in that same exact time period when the Jews were rebelling against God and God handed them over to the hands of the Canaanites. Now to move on it says Canaan was of a significant geopolitical importance in the late Bronze Age or Mana period. Now check this out. It says, as the area where the spheres of interest of the Egyptian, Hittite, and Assyrian empires converged. So what is the principal nations that we witness are going through a lot of issues right now in the Middle East, or not even issues, but are becoming major political figures. Egypt is one, and what about Syria? So there's more information that is connecting Judges chapter 4 to the events we're seeing happening right now. And so now, who is Canaan? Well, Canaan was the son of Ham. We all know this. Um, Ham was cursed by his grandfather Noah. No, I'm sorry. Canaan was cursed by his grandfather Noah because of the sins of Ham and what he committed in Genesis chapter 9 verses 21 through 27. And we all remember that story. In addition to that, Canaan is the grandfather of Nimrod. And the Hebraic meaning of the name Nimrod is we will rebel. And so right now we are seeing that the rise of the Canaanites is taking place in the Middle East. And when we refer back to who Canaan was, Canaan is the grandfather of Nimrod, where the Antichrist, the first Antichrist, the first anti-God figure would arise from. And so now are not the people in the Middle East, are not the Muslims waiting for the coming Mahdi? 
So there is more connections, more ties that is taking place. Next, it says Nimrod was the first king of Shinar, ancient Babylon. In Shinar, Nimrod was king over Babel and Nineveh. So pretty much he had the, the territories of Babylon and Assyria under his control. Right now, what territories is ISIS currently moving ahead and trying to occupy and control? We see that ISIS is predominantly you know, operating in Iraq, formerly known as Babylon, and now uh, in Syria, formerly known as Assyria more connections here so are they actually building the canaanite empire once again so this way they could bring forth their anti-god their antichrist nimrod the mahadi and so nimrod led the people to rebel and build the tower of babel and we know that story in genesis chapter 11 verses 1 through 9 and so nimrod was the king and creator of the first new world order and what we see in today a new caliphate to rule the world and so nimrod was anti-god so next let's talk about the uh, rain and hazar because we saw in the scripture where it speaks of hazar why do we care about hazar and it says that um it is the site of an ancient fortified city in upper galilee among the most important canaanite towns and the largest ancient ruin in modern Israel, a UNESCO's World Heritage Site. Um, so pretty much this particular territory, you know, Hazar, is controlled by the UN. And so if it is controlled by the UN, then when the lawless one, the Antichrist comes, or if he's already amongst us, he already has free territory in which he can go to and fro as he pleases. So that already tells you that there is already a foothold for the UN to already help usher in further, you know, plans, any further kind of schemes that they have in order to bring in their Messiah. And so let's look at the meaning of the word Hazar. So the meaning of the name in Hebrew is discerner or the, or the wise. And when we go back to Revelations chapter 13, remember it says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. So there is still so you see how the Lord is connecting these words together so this way we're paying attention. Next we're gonna to go to uh verse number four through five and it says and Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time, and she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. So pretty much when the Lord, or before the time of the kings, we knew that the Lord would rise up judges who would take um, the leadership role in leading the people back to God and teaching them, you know, the way in which they can be delivered from the oppressors of their enemy and so right here the role that deborah the prophetess is playing is the same exact role that we will see in the end times with the two witnesses because the two witnesses will act as a type of judge and so when they're acting as a type of judge this is where people will come to the two witnesses to receive judgments as many people know will happen as the two witnesses will be used to bring back the lost sheep you know the jews and help them to receive jesus christ and so israel was under judgment during that time because of sin in, in the land a prophetess was assigned the role of judging the people on behalf of god the israelites began to turn from their sins and hearken their ears to the lord and so once again we're gonna we spoke about the two witnesses and let's read some stuff in the revelations chapter chapter 11 to give us an idea as to what the prophetess deborah was doing at that time and what we can expect to see in the end time and so it says and there was given me a reed like unto a rod and the angel stood saying rise and measure the temple of god and the altar and then that worship therein but the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the gentiles now isn't it interesting that the Israelites were under the oppressive hands of Jabin, king of Canaan. And so they had like free reign to move to and fro into, you know, the city as they please. 
And so we see here in verse number two how it says that the courts are given to the Gentiles. Uh, moving along, it says, And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Just like the Canaanites was treading and oppressing the Israelite people for 20 years. And it says, I, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy, as Deborah had prophesied. But it gives you a time period in which they would do it. It says, A thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. So if they're clothed in, clothed in sackcloth, it means that they're beseeching the people to repent and to come out of their sins and receive the mercies of God. And it says, These are the two olive trees. So here it speaks about the olive trees, but when we go back to the scripture, it says that Deborah, you know, she dwelt under the palm tree. So the two witnesses, olive tree, and Deborah hung out around a palm tree. And it says, and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man shall hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they like. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pits shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. We are familiar with this text. We're proceeding to verse number six through nine and it says and she sent and called Barak the son of Abinoam so Barak was a descendant of Abinoam you know Barak came from Abinoam I want you to remember this a uh, little you know piece of information because you will see its importance later on and it goes on to say, Out of uh, Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali, and of the children of Zebulun? And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, Sisera, the king of uh, the captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude and I will deliver him into thine hand so right here the Lord is speaking through the prophetess Deborah who is telling Barak that this is what I'm going to do for you grab these number of men these 10,000 men I commanded you you are going to meet them at Tabor I am going to bring the captain Jabin onto this same valley and trust me because trust me for my hand of deliverance to be upon you and that you shall slay Jabin and deliver the people of Israel from the oppression of the Canaanites but look what happened this is what Barak said he says and Barak said unto her if thou wilt go with me then I will go but if thou wilt not go with me then I will not go so there is a big error here Barak put his trust in a human being and not in God alone. See, his confidence came from the prophetess. It didn't come from God. And so here is the danger. What if this prophetess was a false prophet? What if she was sent there to intentionally confuse, J uh, to confuse Barak and to give him the wrong message, a deceiving message in which he would have actually followed her into this valley and Jabin would have ended up killing him. So the fact that he put his trust in a man, you know, or in a woman in this, in this case and not in God has already set him up where he could have easily led his men to be slaughtered. Because like I said before, if she was a false prophetess, he would have put his trust and his faith in a false prophetess who would have ended up leading him astray onto his own death. Interesting, isn't it? And so now, and she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. So pretty much the prophetess Deborah spoke the word of the Lord onto Barak, telling him that, okay, well, I will go with you. But understand that because you did not believe my, you did not believe God, but instead you put your trust in me, this honor will not go to you, but rather this honor shall go to a woman who shall deliver the people out of the hands of Jabin the king. And so moving along, 
What is the Hebraic meaning of Barak with all uh, with all consonantal spelling? Right. So if you look at it, there are two forms to write the name Barak. There is the B R K, which is the Hebraic form, and the B R Q, which is the Arabic form. And now when you search these names up, it actually comes up with some particular meanings. And I think you're going to find it very interesting. So here's a list of things that you would uh, hear about these two words, well, two spellings of this word. It means lighting, to shine, blessed, to make kneel down, to stoop, to cower, to prostrate, to venerate, to curse, to blaspheme, to gleam, to open widely, set of the eyes, flash, to give light, and to be visible. So based on these words right, right here, this can easily be explaining, you know, Lucifer, right? Like the definition, when you look at it and what it can mean, this is something that sounds like Lucifer's uh, characteristics. You know, this is the characteristics of, you know, Barak, of the name Barak, all right? So now let's look at his father. The Hebraic meaning of the name Abinoam, however, is father of beauty, father of kindness, father of pleasantness. So now remember how I told you before when we connect, you know, Barak being the son of Abinoam. Now think of Lucifer when it comes to God the Father. You know, from you know God created Lucifer. Abinoam gave birth to Barak. And what we see here is that Barak, you know, in this story and comparison to what it means and how we can connect it to Lucifer, it shows a pinpoint accurate description of how Lucifer is. And then when we go to Abinoam and compare him to God the Father, we see an, a pinpoint accuracy of God the Father. So right there, there's another message in which God is telling you, you know, that there is a meaning behind these, these things that we need to pay attention to. Next, we have the citadel of Kadesh, because it was mentioned that Deborah, uh, Deborah the prophetess went with Barak to Kadesh in order to slay Sisera. And so it says the ruins of the ancient Canaanite village of Kadesh, so it was a Canaanite village, are located three kilometers northeast of the modern uh, kibbutz Malkia in Israel on the Israeli Lebanese border. So it is telling you that <clears throat> the meeting point for this combat that was going to take place between Barak and Sisera was a place at the border of Lebanon. You know, Lebanon is a type of gateway, a passageway into the land of Israel. So they met pretty much at the gates of the border where if whoever ends up winning this battle would end up having their land you know, invaded by the winner. And so what other information we could pull here? Okay, so in the 8th century BCE, during the reign of Pekah, king of Israel, all right, so Pekah was the king of Israel. It says uh, Tiglath um, Pileser III of Assyria took Kadesh and deported its inhabitants to Assyria. So the border in which we were just speaking about, the town of Kadesh, was overtaken by the Assyrians. Right. So when we connect it to modern day times, if ISIS managed to, you know, capture Lebanon, right, this is going to open up the doorway straight into Israel. Now, let's go on to the next slide. And so next, we're going to talk about uh, briefly the tribe of Nephtali that was mentioned in the scriptures in verses 6 through 9. And so we know that Nephtali was the son of Jacob. And the Hebraic meaning of this word is my struggle. And so when we hear the word my struggle as it pertains to Jacob, we recall the uh, issue between Jacob and Esau where Jacob received the report that Esau was on his way to meet him. Now, in Jacob's mind, he only remembers that Esau wanted 
uh, wish to take vengeance upon Jacob and that the reason why Esau did not do anything at first is because you know both their father and mother was still alive but once they passed away there was nothing to keep Esau from coming to exact his vengeance upon Jacob and so as a result we know the story how Jacob you know sent his family ahead of him and stuff and split up you know his um, property and along the road you know Jacob he met God and so there was a wrestling match you know a struggle that occurred between the two between God and Jacob where Jacob would not let God go you know until he blessed him and so I think what was part of the blessing you know part of the thing that happened in this struggle is not only for Jacob to be blessed with you know descendants and prosperity and and to carry on the seed of Christ but also to be delivered from the hands of his brother you know why else would he be thinking about something else like being blessed in great abundance when he saw when he knew that his brother Esau was hot on his trail to kill him and so I think that in this struggle that when part of the blessing that the Lord gave Jacob was peace and deliverance from his enemies and so originally Esau could have had his mind set to kill his brother but then during this struggle between Jacob and God God changed the heart of Esau so that by the time that Esau made it to him he had a new mindset and instead of being a bloodbath it was more of a reunion but we know that this reunion didn't last for too long as their future descendants will continue on in this war. And so we get the Hebraic meaning, my struggle, which is Jacob's trouble, which also relates us to the Great Tribulation. And now moving on to see, it says in 732 BCE, Pekah, allied with Risen, king of Edom. You can see the uh, map over there to get an idea as to where these things were. And threatened Jerusalem. And Ahaz, king of Judah, appealed to Tiglath Pilazar III, the king of Assyria, for help. After Ahaz paid tribute to Tiglath um, Pilazar, uh, Tiglath um, Pilazar sacked Damascus. What's happening today in Damascus, right? So he sacked Damascus and Israel. Now we're not talking about all of Israel, but just the northern kingdom. And annexing Edom and a large part of Israel, including all the land of Nephtali. So according to 2 Kings 16 and 15, uh, 15 verse 20, the population of Edom and the annexed parts of Israel were deported. In other words, they were sent into captivity to Assyria. The kingdom of Israel continued to exist until 723 BC when it was again invaded by Assyria and the rest of the population deported. From that time, the tribe of Nephtali has been counted as one of the missing tribes of Israel. And so, to summarize this, so we have the northern kingdom of Israel allied with Edom to conquer the southern kingdom of Judah, right? Jerusalem. And so, the southern kingdom of Judah paid the king of Assyria to help fight Edom and the northern kingdom of Israel. The Assyrian kingdom agreed and sacked Damascus and the northern kingdom of Israel and both of these nations were sent to captivity in Assyria and so when we look at the situation in the Middle East when it pertains to the direct northern kingdoms like Lebanon, Lebanon Iran, Iraq and so forth right ISIS today is a mixture of the Israelites in the ancient northern kingdom of Israel along with other nations that will someday return and fight against their brother, brother Judah once more. So it's very interesting that many of the people who are part of ISIS belong to the captivity of Israel that was sent into um, Assyria where they mingled with you know the Gentiles that was there. Now let's speak of Mount Tabor. So located, it's located in Lower Galilee, Israel, as the eastern end of the Jezreel Valley, 11 miles west of the Sea of Galilee. It was the site of the Mount Tabor battle between Barak, under the leadership of the Israelite judge Deborah, and the army of Jabin, commanded by Sisera in the mid 12th um, century BCE. It is believed by many Christians to be the site of the transfiguration of Jerusalem. I mean, I'm sorry, of Jesus. It is also known as 
Hare Tavar et Birium. Uh, Jebel et Tur, <laughs> the Mount of Configuration. So pretty much the battle took place where Christians believe that the Mount of Transfiguration took place uh, with Jesus. Now let's move on to verse number 17. And it says, However, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Hebar, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, king of Hazar, and a house of Kabar, the Canaanite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera, and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not fear. And when he had turned aside with her into the tent, she covered him with a blanket. And so, before we go on to describing the names here, remember how in the book of Daniel, where it says that the Antichrist will pitch his tent you know, between the Holy Land and I believe the territory of the North. But then while he is there, that is when he will meet his fate. And so right here we see how Sisera, who goes into the tent of Jael, or Yale, I think that's how you pronounce it, where he is also in the tent, where he also will meet his fate. You see that parallel there? And so the Hebraic meaning of Yale is mountain goat. <laughs> I don't know any further co connection there, but you know her name means mountain goat. And so Sisera was put to flight by the army of Barak. And so now we go to verse number 21 to 22. And it says, And uh, then Yahel, Heber's wife, took a tent peg, we spoke about this, remember? Tent peg, and took a hammer in her hand, and went softly to him, and drove the peg into his temple, and it went down into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary. And so he died. And then as Barak pursued Sisera, Yahel came out to meet him, and said to him, Come, I will show you the man whom you seek. And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera dead with the peg in his temple. Wow. And like I said before, this is kind of like something we can compare to the book of Daniel about when the Antichrist pitches his, his tent, you know, between the Holy Land and the territory of the north where the invading armies are coming in. And he meets his end, his end also in that position in that tent but anyway moving along so the actions taken by Yahel reflects the representation of the words that we learn of Tav which means mark signature or wound Adesh head and Semek tent peg as she took a tent peg and drove it through the temple of his head causing a wound and so next we are on Judges chapter 5 verses 19 to 21. And this is a prophetic song that was sung by the prophetess Deborah. Now pay close attention to, this, to these words. It is very important. And it says, The kings came and fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. <laughs> Doesn't that sound familiar, that word? And check this out. This should sound familiar to you as well. It says, they took no spoils of silver. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. That ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. Oh, my soul, march on in strength. So in Deborah's song of victory sung with Barak, she recounts the events. She mentions the battle fought near Megiddo, which is translated to Armageddon. It serves as a foreshadow for the things to come during the end time. And do you see how she even spoke about how God fought against them in the you know in this battle? That it was the heavens and the stars that participated. These are the angels that she's speaking of that came down onto this great battle of Armageddon to deliver the people. So she was looking deep into the future when she sung this prophetic song. 
And next in Revelation chapter 16, let's see what it says here. It says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on a great river Euphrates, and its waters was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. <laughs> so remember how she was just speaking about where she says, where is it? The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. And it says, uh, they fought from the heavens. So this right here is a parallel between what she's saying and what we see in the scriptures. And it says, behold, I am coming as a thief. This is the Lord speaking. You know, the Lord is coming from heaven to fight this battle upon earth. And it says, Blessed is he who watches and keep his garments, lest he walk naked and see, and they see his shame. And it, it ends in verse 16 by saying, And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. And so before we move into Zechariah chapter 14, I want to re-emphasize what we've learned so far in verses 19 to 21 in Judges chapter 5. And it says, the kings, using the plural sense, came and fought. Then it goes on to say once again in the plural, then the kings of Canaan fought in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo, which we know is now Armageddon. And then it also says they took no spoils of silver. Spoils of silver, right? And then in verse 20, it says they fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. Now, this here is mentioning how from the very throne room of God, from the very heavenly places, that the Lord participated in this battle to deliver um, the people of Israel out of the hands of the Canaanites and all the other kings that came with them. And then it goes on to say, the torrent of Kishon swept them away. That ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. Oh, my soul, march on in strength. Now, let's see how this connects to Zechariah chapter 14, which is a declaration against the Canaanites after the battle of Armageddon. And it says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations, plural, against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken. In the same way where the Canaanites were oppressing the Israelites for 20 years, the Lord is telling you that in the end times, these nations that will come against Israel will take the city. And it says, And the houses raffled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity. Remember what happened in the book of Judges, how the Israelites who fought against Jerusalem were sent into captivity. Right? So you see there's a connection here. And it goes on to say, And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Now, check this out in verse number 3. Verse number 3 connects to Judges chapter 5, verse 20, where it says, They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. Um, and it says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east and the mount of olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west and there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south and ye it says and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto azale now remember how when the lord told barak um, via the prophetess deborah that he will meet Jabin, Jabin's army in a particular location in a mountain, you know, in a valley region. So you see how the Lord is connecting the story together where it says that they will flee to the valley of the mountains. Um, so moving along, it says, yeah, because yeah, remember, Sisera was also fleeing from the army of Barak. Sisera fled where he met Yael, one of their friends, who then, you know, took the tent peg and drove it through his temple. So that right there is telling you the parallel of what's going on. And it says, Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Hmm. 
And it says, And the Lord my God shall come. Remember how it says that they fought from the heavens? And verses 20, 19 and 21. And let me see where's my place. And it says, And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. Now, when it says all the saints with thee, it says in verse 20 in Judges chapter 5, the stars from their courses fought against Sisera. Right? So these are the saints. So you have God coming down and the saints that would be in the midst of the Lord fighting too from heaven. And it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night. But it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it goes on to say, And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them will be no rain. And check this out. Remember how we speak, spoke about the geopolitical figures that played a major role during this time was Egypt and Assyria? Now check this out. It mentions Egypt again. It says, If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague which, uh, which, with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And then in verse 19, this shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord, Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah. See, we're speaking about, you know, the king of Judah, the king of Jerusalem and the Judges chapter four. It says, and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. Now check out this final sentence. It says, And that day there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. So the Lord is telling you is that the events that took place in the book of Judges, uh, chapter 4 and 5, is repeating itself. It is repeating itself, but it's coming in in a different kind of dynamic, in a different kind of flavor. Because remember, we were looking at how the people that we think would have been the bad guys were actually the good guys in the Old Testament. But who knows how the roles will play out now. But it's just that we saw all these different puzzle pieces that was presented to us. And soon we're going to see all these different pieces come together in the final picture. And so this concludes part two. Now, I said before that it would only be a part two series, but to, for the sake of not making the videos too long, I broke it down even further. So there may be two or three more parts. I right, thank you for listening, and I pray that she was blessed by the hearing of this message.